there's no amount of money on earth that will restore our youth back. We lost those years. That was Kevin Richardson. You just heard from one of the men wrongfully convicted in the infamously now known Central Park Five. Now, the men, as Dominic told you, have reached a $41 million settlement with New York after DNA evidence and a confession by another man led to their exoneration in that case. And uh, as you heard, Dominic spoke earlier with Raymond Santana, wrongfully convicted. Let me bring in the, the table. And I want to get to the math in a little bit and, and what number is the right number, if there even is such a number. But, Rich, you've had some background on this. I remember when I first heard this case, and there's been others too, who would confess to a crime you never did? Um, but maybe now that I got a 12-year-old, the idea that in two years she could sit in a room for 30 hours with the cops and not tell them that the, you know, that the, the moon is uh, orange or whatever, I, you'll say whatever you got to do to get out of the room, right? Police officers who do this kind of work are experts at getting people to confess to crimes. And they, their job when they enter that room is to get the defendant to confess to an offense. And they are permitted under our law to lie to them uh, under many circumstances. There are some limits on that in the New York Court of Appeals, but they're permitted to lie to people, to say that other people have confessed, that it have blamed them, that, uh, you know, in, in one case, uh, that, you know, the, the dying person said, you know, the defendant did it when they didn't do any such thing. And over many hours, they, they make the defendant feel that his only out is to confess and that once he agrees with them, this whole ordeal will be over, only to find out that the ordeal has just begun. Are there rules like there were in this case about keeping somebody in an interrogation room for a period of time? Are there time limits to how long you're supposed to be able to do that? It's all to be considered by a judge on a motion to suppress statements. So you have to allege that the statements were involuntarily made and then a judge, like the judge in their case, decided that, oh, these confessions were perfectly fine and should be considered by the jury, which happens. At one point of clarity that we saw some video from, um, I guess, the confession portions of it, but that's just the confession part. We don't have for posterity the 30 hours or 15 hours of uh, the interrogations. Uh, now, we get to the math in this, and I've always been amazed. And I've interviewed a few guys over the years that uh, had been exonerated after the fact for a crime they didn't commit. In fact, we were talking before, uh, Jeffrey Deskovitz sat at this table and others as well. The formula they come up with to attach to your life and the valuation, I guess, of a year behind bars, um, and then I, I guess the leverage point as to what you're willing to take as the clock's ticking on your life. These guys are 40. Some people have gotten out in their 50s or whatever. Explain how the math works because... I guess, theoretically, I would get more than maybe a Santana because my earning potential uh, is worth more. How do they come up with what the, what the number is? Well, it has to do with how outrageous the conduct was of the police, how obviously innocent in the light of day the person is, how horribly the person suffered over how long a period of time. In this case, these people were unfairly vilified, uh, compared to animals, the wolf pack business, the wilding business. They were held up to public shame and ridicule uh, and embarrassment and humili humiliation for many years. So all of that, it's not just that the person was imprisoned. It's how the whole world viewed them publicly uh, over a period of time. I mean, on a more fundamental level, does it really matter? I mean, what was the most affecting part of that interview? The most affecting part, and for me, where it really hit home was where he said, I'm going to take this to my grave. It's going to go with me to my grave. Yeah. Not everybody who's locked up for that long a period of time is a Nelson Mandela, is an Elie Wiesel. Not everyone is an extraordinary human being that can overcome something like that. The average person, you don't get past something like that. Your life is ruined. And How you know, Mark, to that point, yeah. Dom, I've heard guys tell me when they went in, they had never used a computer before, and they get out, and all of a sudden, it's like a scene out of one of those movies where you come out of a cryogenic tube or something. Yeah. They don't recognize the world. Their spouses moved on. These kids were kids at the time. Their families have either moved on, abandoned, or whatever the case may be. And he told you before, who employs a guy that has on his uh, resume Central Park jogger case? I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Richard. That's one of the things Mr. Santana will talk about tomorrow night. 
Because many of us, if you're going to receive a settlement of five to seven million dollars, your days of working, no offense, are over, you know. And so he's like, no, I'm going to continue to work. And I'm like, this is tomorrow. And I'm like, why? He says, you have to understand, I couldn't get a job for years. I couldn't get a job for years. And so now he works for a local union. He enjoys it. He's going to stay in the community. One of the things that he missed, counselor, that you talked about, and this was the only time he almost came to tears in the interview. This was tomorrow night. We almost, I should say, he almost became emotional. While he was in jail, remember, they're kids in jail. His mother died. Oh. His father was catching hell at his job. You're the father of a rapist. The, you know, and, and his father was being attacked at his job, but he never gave up on his son. And then Mr. Santana's mother dies while he's in prison. Well, I'm, I'm hardly a flag-waving defense lawyer, as you know, but sometimes defense lawyers really do an honorable thing, and not just in exonerating these people. Marty Tankliff, who Rich was talking about off camera, he went to work for the lawyer that helped him get exonerated and then went to law school. Jabbar Collins, who Joel Rudin uh, got off in, in Brooklyn, is now a paralegal in Joel Rudin's office. So sometimes these people learn about the law in prison, and they can come out and actually do that job. And but sometimes, Richard, they don't take plea deals where they could get early if it requires them to acknowledge their guilt. Sometimes, even if they have an opportunity to get out, they refuse, even if there's not a promise they'll ever get out uh, because they got to maintain their innocence. I guess that's one of the only things that'll get them through. Some people are risk averse and will plead guilty to a crime they didn't commit, and we see this happening too. Some people would never commit would never admit that they committed a crime that they didn't commit. Well, th th this happened in 1989, and it's counterintuitive that somebody would falsely confess to something that they didn't do. It's the confession, if you're a prosecutor, you're going to wave that confession around, and that's the most powerful piece of evidence that you can imagine. But in all the years that have, have passed since 1989, there's a vast body of research on the psychology of false confessions to the point where defense lawyers now in many jurisdictions have a right to call an expert to explain how people could confess to things that they didn't do to mitigate uh, the inherent power that the confession mm. appears to have. Uh, I'm it, sorry, we, yeah. I know we talked about the monetary settlement. I, I'm sure there's some people at home who are wondering if there's any penalty or any action that can be taken against the police officers or the prosecutors, there were other parts of the case that didn't add up. Their, their five stories didn't match up, even though they all confessed. It's, an impract it's somewhat impractical to, to try to sue or go after or penalize the prosecutors or the police in some way. Is it that right? It has to be horrifically negligent. Right? They're the lawyers, but it's my understanding you can't them. sue yeah, the prosecutors. Usually be and, uh, unless, unless it's really something bad. You can't sue the judge, you can't sue the prosecutors for the most part. And remember, you have your cash settlement in this case of $41 million, mm -hmm. but no acknowledgement from the city that anything was done wrong. Generally not the judge, generally not the prosecutor. You can sue the cops, but generally they'll be indemnified. But if they withheld the evidence, if they docked there are, evidence. There are way, yeah. there, uh, prosecution is protected by qualified immunity, which means most of the time they can't be sued if they do something that's way beyond the pale that can be mm -hmm. overcome. The judge, it's, it's a tough one. We've hurdle. seen some cases recently where they've been removed here from their jobs, but that's about the worst punishment. Okay, and again, everyone, uh, sound off on this question here. Head over to Facebook and Twitter, sound off on our second question of the day. Uh, you, we talked about the monetary uh, settlement here. Is there any number out there that would be worth spending six, 13 years of your life in prison? And again, Dominic will have part two of his interview tomorrow night. All right, coming up next, opponents of hydrofracking won a big legal fight in a courtroom, this time in New York's top court. And it says that towns are in control and can ban the controversial practice despite opposition from the state. The panel weighs in on that case and more when we come back.